Hello everyone, this is Chrisom, and I'd like to welcome you to this conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experiences. This conversation, I'd like to discuss with you the Kundalini Safety Protocols. You can read about these protocols at www.kundalinisafeties.com. All right. Back in in, I believe uh, 2006 or 2007, I was giving a seminar in Santa Cruz, California, a Kundalini awakening seminar. And uh, I had uh, a gentleman there at the seminar. And, and uh, at that time, I was giving Shakti Pot at the Saturday night aspect. It was a it was a two day seminar, and I was giving Shakti Pot on the Saturday night, and uh, he received. This is a gentleman uh, owned a flower company from Ecuador, and uh, and I won't mention his name. It's a very very nice person, very very uh, respectful, kind, considerate, and he took Shakti Pot, and the Sunday morning. He came back and took off his shirt and showed everybody the welts on the day. And I noticed, uh, he, I mean, you know, the, the marks were clear to see. But I also noticed that they were healing very quickly. And by the end of the day, they weren't there anymore. But everybody got to see them, myself included. And I was disturbed a bit because I, I had never seen my, you know, the Shakti pot that comes through me put welts on a person's body. And they weren't, you know, he said they weren't painful or anything, but he was surprised to see them, as was everybody, and so was I. And one of the first tenets or rules that I follow for myself uh, regarding these areas is do no harm. Right. Do not harm a person. And I, you know, it really triggered my my caution about even giving Shakti Pot. And it, I didn't really want to give Shakti Pot after that. For me, it was not, uh, you know, if, if it was going to leave marks on a person, what else was it doing to the other four bodies of the human expression? And I got to see that later on as I visited his home uh, in San Diego after the seminar, and I could see his personality changing and becoming more sharp in an exact way, like asking his daughter if she vacuumed the floor and then pointing out from across the room a small dust moat and saying, well, what is that over there? And we all looked, and I was wondering, well, what the heck is he looking at? You know, and then he pointed out it was a, you know, this little dust mode, and it's like, and I'm going, oh boy, here we go. You know, somebody's becoming compulsive and obsessive about specific things, and boom, you can relate that right back to the Shakti pot. So I learned my lesson with that, and he eventually, you know, calmed down and, and you know, continued on his Kundalini path. But uh, it, it, it made a big difference in, in me and how I was going to continue to teach or to, to even give Shakti Pod at a seminar. And so I meditated and I knew I, I needed to come up with some sort of a safety format so that people could receive the Shakti Pod safely without going crazy, without getting manic without being OCD about it, and grace, the kundalini grace came through and took information from almost every system on this world, from Taoism to, to Western Christianity to Tibetan uh, belief structures to shamanism, I mean, she took from everything and compiled it into a set of protocols that, you know, I named the Kundalini Safety Protocols. 
And once again, you can get there by going www.kundalinisafeties, all one word, dot com. The safeties exist for a person to be able to have a safe and sane experience with uh, in tandem and yet in harmony with their kundalini. Now, you know, I've had some detractors come on board and they say, well, you know, you can still have a bad experience when you practice the safeties. And yes, indeed, you can still have a bad experience if that is what you need to have. If you're not forgiving enough, if you don't have enough gratitude, if you don't have enough self-discipline, if you're not willing to take self-responsibility for your actions and your thoughts and your attitudes while you have the kundalini, well, yeah, you could open yourself to having a bad experience. But you don't have to have a bad experience. You don't have to. And the safeties definitely point away to having a, a, a grace-based cushion of positive harmony with your kundalini. So here we go. The first thing I like to do within the safeties is to generate or excite the kundalini. And so what we do is we we do the first Tibetan. The, the five Tibetans are a a, uh, a list of Tibetan yoga that is vertical yoga, meaning it doesn't go eventually up like this. It just goes from here, boom, to there. And it pulls energy. The five Tibetans will pull energy from the first chakra to the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Okay? And it's very effective. In, in These exercises are very effective in pulling the kundalini this way. And so we spin to the right 21 times. And so your, your, your hands are outstretched. I, I'm sure you can't see it here on the, on the camera, but you spin to the right. Go to www.kundalinisafeties.com, and you can see there's videos. We have videos on it at Prism Kundalini on YouTube. You know, I have 350-some-odd videos there, and the, the first few of them are on this topic. And so you spin to the right, keeping your fingers together. Some people like to have one hand up, the other hand down. Some people have both hands up. Some people have both hands down. Whatever. You know, you take your pick, whatever you're comfortable with. Spinning to the right. You spin to the right, and you don't spot. Now, what spotting is is when you spin, and you hold your head, and you whip it around so you don't get dizzy, right? The idea is to get dizzy. Let the dizziness happen. Don't resist the dizziness. You're not a ballerina. Okay? You don't need to spot. Okay? You, you just let your head stay in one position as you spin. Okay? You're supposed to be dizzy. I want that to be perfectly clear. You're supposed to be dizzy. And then you lay down and you do the second Tibetan, which is lifting your chin or your, your legs up to around your chest. You can keep your legs straight if you wish. You can bend them at the knee and bring your knees up if you're having a hard time doing that kind of a leg lift. Okay, and then you do the third, the fourth, and the fifth Tibetans. And I want you to, to go ahead and review those on YouTube. Don't just go to any YouTube. Go to the sites that I have set up for you. Go to those videos specifically. Okay. As with so many sacred technologies on YouTube and on the Internet, people decide to insert their own little ideas about how things should be in order to make themselves look important or to make themselves look unique and special. You know, they change it. They change it to, to suit their ego. I don't. I do it strictly the way the Tibetans taught it to go. Okay. And so... I would suggest that you do the same thing. Hmm. So you do the five Tibetans. Then as soon as you're done with the five Tibetans, you you go into, you, you sit in a chair, like a, an upright chair like I'm sitting in right now, or you sit on your muladhara, your rear end. You sit down, cross-legged. I like to 
hook, you know, my thumb through here, then bring my arm around here, and then you do the alternate nostril breathing. Okay? You breathe in, you hold, and you breathe out. And you breathe in, you hold, then you breathe out. Some people call this triangular breathing because, you know, you're following the, the pattern of a triangle. This excites the two nadis that are connected to the spinal column, the ida and the pingala. So you have the ida and you have the pingala. And their termination points are right here, about a quarter of an inch inside the upper lip of each nostril. And so the more you do the alternate nostril breathing, you may feel little uh, areas of irritation or or maybe even a raised bump in there. It's okay. It's just the nadis that is being stimulated. The nadis start at the base of the spine, and they, they uh, entwine around each chakra all the way up, coming around and terminating here. Okay, so they're actually being stimulated so that they, they represent sacred masculine and sacred feminine. And so as, they, as you stimulate those two energies, you're bringing them up along the outside of each of the chakras as you come up. And so what this does is this gives more stimulation to the kundalini itself to rise along the spinal cord, which some would call the shasumna. Okay, I'm trying to, to stick to English here. Let me push this back. So that's what we do right after we do the five Tibetans, okay? And then we do a compression prayer, which is the same thing as the alternate nostril breathing, but on the inhale, you're going, uh, if you're a Christian, you're going the love of Christ, the love of Christ, the love of Christ. If you have a, uh, a theology that you follow, you can go the love of Allah, the love of Allah, the love of Allah, the love of Buddha, the love of Buddha, the love of Buddha. Uh, or you can just go the love of grace, the love of grace, the love of grace, the love of kundalini, the love of kundalini. <laughs> Put in what you want, okay? And so you, you inhale, and you hold, and you say the, the love of grace, the love of grace, the love of grace, and then you exhale, the love of God, the love of God, the love of God. Then you inhale, the love of kundalini, love of kundalini, the love of kundalini. You hold, love of kundalini, love of kundalini, love of kundalini. Exhale. Love of God, love of God, love of God. Okay. What this is doing is this is pancaking a prayer upon the energetic generation that has been caused by the five Tibetans and the pranayama. This puts a bit of power behind it. Okay, so it's important for you to remember that. Uh, do this, do those three things, and then you can go into a meditation and I like people to to uh, to go into meditation try to do an hour if you can if you already have Kundalini then you're gonna be able to do much more than an hour and I see uh, uh, yeah okay uh, somebody's sending me a note here <laughs> But it's hard for me to read it um, uh, while I'm doing this. So I'm just going to continue doing this. Uh, so you meditate for an hour. Now you can sit on the edge of a chair, of a straight back wooden chair. Very simple things here. We're not like having you spend money on special seats to sit on or blocks or any of these things, right? You sit on a plain wooden chair. I know it's not as sexy, but <laughs> that's what you got. You sit on the edge of a wooden chair, okay, with your feet flat on the floor, your hands in the Gyan Mudra here, your fingers like that, on your knees, okay, and you just breathe through your nose, in and out, and just follow the breath like, a, like the ocean when it crashes on the beach, and then when it recedes back into itself, the exhalation, okay, over and over. You do that over and over and over. And this will really help you. 
this helps you get into a nice deep meditation. You do that for an hour, or you can sit on on your your bum. Sit on your bum, cross your legs. Once again, your fingers are in Gaia Mudra here. And you put both hands, both back of your hands, on your knees. And you you know, you don't slouch. You're not doing this. Okay. Your spine is straight, but it's not hyper straight. You're not like, ah, you're not doing that, okay? You, you're just, the spine is straight. So that means it has a natural curve to it. Okay, and your your chin is slightly down. And this stretches the spinal cord with your with your chin slightly down. And you follow that breath. And you just do that for an hour. Some of you may fall asleep, that's okay. Don't don't go into go, oh my god, I fell asleep. Don't worry about that. Okay. You'll eventually stay awake. You just gotta keep practicing it. And then the next very next thing that I'm not sure I have it written down on that web page about devotion. But I think it's important to add it in, and, and I, so I eventually will get it over there. Devotion to Kundalini, devotion to grace. Okay. Devotion to grace is giving your love to grace, your appreciation to grace, your gratitude to grace. And I want to suggest that you do that every single time you practice the safety. This can be about 15 minutes where you you get on your hands and knees and you give yourself to grace. Give yourself to grace with compassion and gratitude and thankfulness and, you know, giving her yourself to the sacred feminine, the sacred mother, the sacred father. And that's the safety. First part. The second part of the safety you must do all the time. And these are levels of self-correction. So uh, if somebody cuts you off on the freeway, on the motorway, and they're such a terribly rude driver, well, you forgive them immediately. You let them in. You don't go after them for revenge. Okay? You let them in. You let them have their way. Okay? Instant forgiveness. And you're going to have to self-correct your, your yourself towards this. It's not an easy thing. It doesn't come naturally for everybody okay so you have instant forgiveness and then you can also have instant gratitude for somebody letting you in okay what you're doing here is you're practicing the noble qualities these noble qualities are what the kundalini really uh, is nourished by honesty integrity truth love forgiveness gratitude these qualities are extremely important. Self-discipline, patience, okay? These areas you want to really, really work on all the time. So if you're, if you're the, you know, working in that busy restaurant or office building or whatever, you know, and somebody is just making you angry just to, to build up their own ego, instead of saying something back to them, just forgive them. And move on. That doesn't mean that I'm suggesting you make yourself a victim. Not at all. What it means is that you don't allow their lower vibration to interrupt your high vibration. Now, in some ways, sometimes, you know, the, the situation requires you to, to shoot back an answer. Like, mind your own business, and I'll mind mine. <laughs> or something like that, right? You'll have to do something to, to, to help them learn how to control their egotism. Uh, if it's with a boss, well, you know, and, and if they're one of these uh, petty tyrants, well, then that's what you're, you're just going to have to deal with that or get a different job, right? Uh, in many ways, petty tyrants are very, very beneficial because they force you, they force you to be forgiving because there's only two ways to go with it. You either forgive and you, and, and you flow with the torrent of abuse that that petty tyrant gives to you, or you become bitter and you quit. Those two ways. Okay. So if you have a petty tyrant as a boss, forgive. And, and have the gratitude for being placed in a position, a pressurized position. 
that your kundalini is allowing you to experience in order to accentuate and to strengthen the quality of the safety of, of forgiveness, tolerance, gratitude. Okay, those three very important qualities. So you practice these all the time. And another one you practice is selfless service, uh, preferably to a stranger, not to your family so much, not to your workmates so much, not to your boss so much, because you're getting paid for that, you know, with your boss. But to a stranger, you know, you help that little old lady or that little kid across the street so they get there safely. You pull the car over, you get out of the car, and you help those people across the street. Think about that. Or you buy somebody lunch surreptitiously. You take you, you you talk to one of the cashiers who's working a line, and you say, "This is for the gentleman that's four four people deep in there." Uh, you hand him a twenty dollar bill, and you say, "Anything that he wants, as much as he wants," and you tell him it's just his special day. And the, the clerk generally agrees with that and, and is, you know, very cooperative. And, and, you know, you always make sure to have the clerk give the gentleman the change. That's his change. Okay, that's your donation to the betterment of another person. Selfless service is what this is. And, and I'm going to strongly suggest that you participate in these areas, too. And then, of course, you know, you're extending levels of kindness to people. You're volunteering perhaps at a soup kitchen or, or you know, a soup kitchen is great uh, and, and, and it's very helpful. And for those of you that are doing it, I'm going to suggest that you continue. But there are things that you can do one-on-one, -on -one, like helping the people across the street, like buying lunch or dinner for somebody, like stepping in if somebody's short of change at the grocery store, and, you know, they're, they're only like a dollar or whatever, so short. And you just step in and say, here it is. And there they go. Okay. Uh, I don't care if they're an alcoholic or a drug addict or a homeless person. You know, it's not up to me to make that judgment. What is up to me is to, to take the moment, take the money or take the action and apply it to that person's life in some way. Okay. If they go out and buy a beer with it, well, that's not on me. That's on them. Okay, if they go out and buy food with it, that's not on me. That's on them. When you give a gift, you're giving a gift. No strings attached. Because Kundalini doesn't attach strings to the gift she gives to you. She just gives it. Okay, so you can see how these practices are harmonizing with your Kundalini, nourishing your understanding of the new world that you have entered into as you begin and continue to walk your kundalini journey. It's very important that you practice these safeties all the time, these second stage. The third stage is to, is to do this daily. Do the five Tibetans, do the pranayama, okay, do the compression prayer, do the meditation, do the devotion. Back when I was struggling within my own activation. I would do these things five times a day. Now, I didn't have the safeties back then, but I was naturally given to do a lot of these practices anyway. She will teach you. You know, I, I hear people on the Internet say, I don't need no guru. Heck, I can do it all by myself. I don't need no guru. I don't need no guy standing up there in a robe telling me what to do. And it's true, you don't. You don't need a guru until you do. And then, you know, you, you know, you may have to find one. But not needing a guru is more of an egotistical attachment to not wanting to receive help from another person who has walked this path before you have. And that, my friend, is not an enviable position. That can lead to a lot of torment, a lot of pain that is unnecessary and that stymies your process, stymies your progress as well. Okay, so 
take the advice of somebody who has walked this path before you, perhaps. I've had this for 59 years. Take the advice and practice these safety protocols. They will assist you. And remember, this is a 24-7 thing. You'll even dream of doing the safeties if you're practicing them assiduously enough. You'll dream of them. They will come to you. The Shakti will help you with them. She'll provide you with examples. She'll provide you with opportunities to help other people, to help yourself, to self-correct. Remember, the main thing with these behavioral safeties is self-correction. No longer are you seeking revenge. No longer are you vindictive. No longer are you going to get so upset and apoplectic in your rage upon somebody else who treated you unfairly. You're rising above these qualities. And I want you to continue to rise. Thank you for watching.